So in this tutorial, we're going to take a look at JavaScript promises and how you can use them to deal with asynchronous or long running code. And we'll first of all start off by looking at some of the problems that JavaScript promises aim to solve. And then we'll look at some actual examples of how you might use this within your projects. So let's dive in. So let's first of all take a look at the problem that promises are trying to address. Imagine if we've got a function like the sumLongProcess function here that has something inside it that takes a particularly long time. And it should be obvious from the three last lines of code here that start and finish should be logged to the console before process complete is logged. And you can see that output in the console below. So if we wanted to do something after the sumLongProcess function has finished, we'd need to put some code up here inside of the set timeout. But if we wanted to vary what happens after the sumLongProcess function has completed each time, what we could do is pass in a function as a parameter known as a callback. And then inside our setTimeout function, we can then just call that function. So now when we call the sumLongProcess function, we can actually pass in a function which will be executed once the setTimeout has completed. And of course we can pass different functions into the sumLongProcess function to vary what happens when it finishes each time. And we're not limited to just using an empty function for our callback, we could actually pass data back with it as well. And then this way, we can make use of whatever data processing the sumLongProcess function has done, such as getting data from a network request or loading an image, for example. So there's nothing wrong with using callbacks as such, but if you have a lot of nested callbacks where you're calling more callbacks inside of callback functions, you can end up with something that's known as callback hell, where your code is really difficult to read and it's also difficult to work out what data is being passed to the various callbacks at different stages. So Promises solve this problem by allowing you to have a chain of callbacks that proceed in a linear fashion. So let's convert this sumLong process function to use a promise. So to create a new promise, we simply instantiate a new promise object using the new keyword. And a new promise object takes one argument, which is a function itself, which inside has two arguments and they're commonly listed as resolve and reject. And you can think of resolve and reject as simply being callbacks as in the previous example that we can use to do some other action once the promise has completed. But before we do that, let's just log out our promise to the console. And as you can see in the console, we get a promise object and its status is currently pending. So a promise can have three states. It can either be pending, fulfilled, or rejected. So currently our promise doesn't do anything. So if we log it out to the console, we just simply see the pending status. And if we want to fulfill a promise, we call the resolve callback. And just as we did with the callback example, we can call the resolve callback and pass in any data that we want to be used for any further actions. So to access the fulfilled promise, we access its then property, which will accept a function. So this is the exact same thing that we did with the callback example, except we're using the then property instead of passing in a function directly into the sum long process function. And of course we can access the data passed back by the resolve callback. And there we can do some further actions depending on what the result is from the resolve function. So we also do have the reject callback function inside of our promise. So let's set that up. So here I've just set another timeout, so the reject callback is called after three seconds. And you'll see we still get the message promise is fulfilled in the console because the resolve callback is actually being called first. So if we were to change that so that the reject callback gets called first, you'll see although we have set up the then block, we get an error message in the console. And that's because any rejected promises need to be caught and we do that by accessing the catch property of the promise. So now you can see in the console that we're getting the promise is rejected message and that's been handled in the catch block. So quite simply, a promise that resolves using the resolve callback will pass data to the then block 
and anything that gets rejected will go to the catch block. There is also a finally property on promises that you can use to run code regardless of whether a promise is resolved or rejected. So here the promise is rejected, but just to show you that will run if the promise is fulfilled as well. So at this point we haven't done anything too much different from the initial callback example, but where promises become really powerful is when you have multiple promises that you want to then chain together. So now when we start our promise chain, the first promise will be resolved, so in our then block we can then call the second promise. And then we can simply add on another then block to deal with the result of the second promise. So this way you can chain promises together so that you can organise some kind of sequence whilst avoiding callback hell. One final note on this section as well is you don't really need to have multiple catch blocks. If one of the promises in your chain rejects, then simply having one catch block in the chain will catch any errors. So here the first promise is actually being rejected, and so we skip over the then blocks and go straight to the catch block. So before we look at some examples, let's take a look at a few more things that you can do with promises. So here we're creating three promises, and they'll each resolve after a random time between 0 and 5 seconds. So rather than chaining all of these promises together, we can use a special promise.all function, which accepts an array of promises and then allows us to access all of the results inside one then block. And the result that we get in the then block is simply an array which represents each of the promises in the order that we gave them in the initial array, not in the order that they resolved. So if one of the promises does reject, You'll see we get a similar problem as we did when we didn't have the initial catch block on our previous example, so all we need to do is set up a catch block if any of the promises do reject. And notice how even though promise 1 and promise 3 are still resolving, we don't actually get any data back for them, so if there's one promise in our array that does reject, all the other data is lost. Another static function that's available on the promise object is promise.race which as the name suggests, takes our three promises, and whichever one resolves or rejects first, that's the result that's put into our then block or our catch block. So if we run this a few more times, you can see we get different results each time, because each of the promises has a random timeout, and the race function will tell us which one resolved or rejected first. So that's an overview of promises and they're really simple to use and hopefully you can see the problem that they're trying to solve, that is to avoid you using callbacks directly and to avoid that callback hell. You might have already been using promises and not really realise it. And probably the most prominent use of promises for front-end developers is using the fetch API. So the fetch API requests some data from a URL. And as you can see in the console, a call to fetch actually returns us a promise. So with that promise, we can simply access its then property. And on the result that comes back from the initial fetch request, and inside that object is a function called JSON, which parses the request data into a JSON format, should the URL come back with that particular content. So as you can see, the JSON function actually returns a promise itself, so in our then block we need to return that to actually access the underlying data. And because we're returning another promise, we need an additional then block to access the data. And then you can see in the second then block we can then access the API data that is returned from GitHub. Of course we might want to put a catch block in there in case the network request fails. So you can see now if we pass in a bad URL, for example, the console.log on line 13 inside of our catch block 
displays the error. So anytime you're doing an operation which takes a certain amount of time, like a network request, promises can be used to simplify the sequence of events that happen after that particular operation has completed. So as you start coding more and more and start working with other libraries and projects, you'll find yourself coming across functions that frequently use promises, so they're a really useful feature to get your head around. So that's it for this tutorial, hopefully you found it useful and you've got a better understanding of promises now. Just before you go, don't forget to subscribe to support the channel and so you don't miss out on any future tutorial updates.